Good evening. My name is Vinay Dharwadkar. I'm a professor of English, World Literature and South Asian Studies at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. My talk this evening uh, has the title, The Translator's Tasks and Kumar Narayan's Short Poetry. I'll be reading from a prepared text. The Translator's Tasks and Kumar Narayan's Short Poetry. Uh, section 1, The Tasks of Translation. When I first encountered Kuvan Narayan's poetry in Delhi in 1980, shortly after the publication of Apne Samne, which happened in 1979, I was struck immediately by his poetic stance and equilibrium, his tone of voice, and his unusual choice, choices of subject matter, and to an equal extent, by the arrangement of his poems on the page, their conciseness, the precision of their effects, and their unmistakable contemporaneity. To my mind, Narayan stood out in comparison with most of the poets I was reading at the time, and in relation to the several kinds of poetry in which I had been immersed in various roles during the preceding decade, that is the 1970s, as an emerging Indian English poet, as an active translator of Marathi and Hindi verse, and as a literary editor by profession as well as vocation. My initial impression turned out to have a lasting impact because it moved me to start translating Narayan's short poems as early as 1983-84, soon after I emigrated to the United States and began my training as a scholar of Indian and South Asian literatures and cultures. In the course of the next several years, my extended exploration of Narayan's oeuvre, as it stood in that decade, confirmed my original estimate of his significance in Hindi in the second half of the 20th century, before sustained commentary on his work had appeared in the language. It also validated my sense of his distinctiveness on a much larger scale, in the national context of post-independence poetry in the Indian languages and in the international context of Anglo-American and British Commonwealth poetry in English, as well as new European poetry in translation in the post-war decades. By the end of the 1980s, my independent assessment of Narayan's poetic achievement, the accumulating value of his multifaceted output across genres, and the uniqueness of some of his poems in the panorama of contemporary world poetry was sufficiently strong for me to continue my engagement with his work over the next 30 years, and especially to keep translating the poetry in short forms that may be the most representative of his innovations in Hindi between the 1950s and the 2000s. I have summarized my engagement with Narayan's writings in personal terms uh, because, on a pra pragmatic level, it provides me with a basis for reflections, arguments, and generalizations on this occasion that are not merely theoretical or abstract. A broader scholarly perspective on India's post-colonial period shows that, since the publication of Chakra View in 1956, Commentators in the Hindi literary sphere have gradually developed a fine-grained consensus on his accomplishments. This body of public opinion acquired critical density by the 1990s and gathered momentum in the first two decades of the 21st century. By now, it has spread well beyond the cultural circumference of Hindi and has established a presence in a large number of languages in the subcontinental and international marketplaces. A widening intellectual context of this kind raises a variety of questions about the most effective way to conceptualize it, especially when the patterns of cross-cultural interaction between modern Indian writers and Europhone readers remain uh, unclear. If we approach this conceptualization from a fresh angle, then four of these questions may be framed as starting points for an inquiry uh, 
along new lines as follows. Let me frame the questions in a bare form. What processes, first, what processes of interpretation does Narayan's poetry require, especially in its con uh, complicated cultural and historical context, so that diverse readerships can access it with reassurance across languages and national boundaries? Second, which parts of Narayan's oeuvre in Hindi contain his most characteristic, innovative and memorable writing? In other words, how can we build a handy choice of representative texts as a first sample for readers who are unfamiliar with contemporary Hindi literature? Third, which specific features of his work define Narayan's distinctiveness as a writer in an international or, or global frame of reference? Fourth, what goals should translation pursue for a particular choice of host language? And what standards should it meet in a case such as Narayan's? What are the translator's responsibilities in all senses of this term in a multifaceted process of this kind? These and other such questions are obviously too large to be addressed in a single talk, but they're important to spell out because the issues they express affect how we approach the practical project of representing and explaining Narayan across languages to readers without access to Hindi. In the limited time available today, I will focus in theoretical as well as practical ways on the methods, objectives, contexts and responsibilities of translators and translations. I will also limit myself to a few suggestive answers rather than definitive ones and concentrate primarily on his poetry in short forms as represented in three collections, Chakraview, 1956, Apne Samne, 1979, and Koi Dusra Nahi, 1993. Section 2, the translator's general orientations and the ideal of poetic translation today. Like any translator, a bilingual reader who is motivated to render Narayan's poetry from Hindi into another language, whichever language that may be, has to start by choosing a general orientation towards the tasks on hand. This encompassing orientation enables him or her first to set practical goals of the kind of translation to be produced, second, to choose a specific method of rendition or a set of strategies commensurate with those goals, third, to decide on the kind of intertextual relations between original and translation to aim for, and fourth, to specify the criteria with which to self-reflexively assess the project while it is in progress and when it is complete. The history of translation studies in the Europhone world since the late 17th century has made three basic methodological orientations commonplace as matters of practical choice. And as theorists from John Dryden and Friedrich Schleiermacher to Walter Benjamin and Vladimir Nobokov and on to Lawrence Venuti and Emily Apter agree broadly, each of these choices of orientation places the processes and outcomes of translation on a continuous spectrum rather than in mutually exclusive boxes. A translator's choice of orientation today may still be placed on a gradient of this sort using the three technical terms that Dryden invented for it in 1680. A translator's first possible choice of orientation is the ideal and method of metaphrase under which he or she renders a poem, quote, word by word and line by line from one language to another. Goethe in 1819 adapted Dryden's conception to define the paradigm 
of interlinear translation which aims, in Goethe's words, to achieve perfect identity with the original. Historically, the model of interlinearity became the norm for the most literal renderings of biblical texts from Hebrew and Greek into some 4,000 languages around the world in the next 100 years or so. Along a parallel track, over a somewhat longer period, metaphrastic rendition also became the orientation of choice in classical, comparative and general Euro-American philology and carried over into the disciplines, namely classics, comparative literature and literary studies, descended from them since the late 19th century. In the present-day continuation of philological translation in all these institutional settings, metaphrase conceived narrowly remains the ideal of verbal accuracy and semantic fidelity to a source text, but without regard to its original form or beauty. In specific circumstances and for practical reasons, a translator may opt for a different second orientation which focuses on rendering a text by the method not of metaphrase but of paraphrase. In this approach, the translator restates a text's message at some distant, a distance from its original phrasing and aims to summarize its general meaning rather than its finer nuances or details. In Dryden's words, paraphrase is, quote, translation with latitude. Many translators still make this choice for the rendition of long works for passages that digress distractingly from the main themes of an epic or novel and for audiences who seek only a concise representation of the contents or meanings of a text without a replication of the whole. In the contemporary marketplace, paraphrastic translation usually results in a relatively compact, widely and easily accessible retelling of a source text. The best recent example of the application of this methodological orientation on an ambitious scale is Karal Satyamurti's Mahabharat, a modern retelling from 2015, which compresses the full narrative of the epic to about 27,000 lines of contemporary English blank verse, nearly 900 printed pages, in a superbly crafted, accordion-like, elastic structure of astonishing effectiveness without metaphrase. A third possibility is for a translator, either from a lack of philological skill or by literary intention, to produce an imitation of a source text which does not seek either the literal replication of meaning in a metaphrase or the systematic condensation of discourse in a paraphrase and instead tries to capture its imaginative spirit directly independent of textual constraints. Dryden notes that in an imitation, quote, the translator assumes the liberty not only to vary from the words and the sense of the source text, but to forsake them both as he sees occasion." Unquote. Whereas Schleiermacher observes that an imitator, quote, sacrifices the identity of the work, unquote, in its original expression. A translation that pursues the ideal of imitation is usually an unreliable rendering of a source text as it was composed in its own time, place and verbal medium. Such a version often serves the translator's purposes more than the author's. For example, it may be a later writer's homage to an earlier uh, writer expressing gratitude or admiration, or in a less benign mode, it may be a weaker ephebes belated appropriation of a stronger precursor's originality. Many of Arvind Krishna Mehrotra's versions of Kabir in the 2000s and 2010s 
are self-professed imitations that transgress criteria of verbal fidelity and instead attempt to capture the spirit of the 15th century Hindi poet and convey it creatively in English to audiences in the 21st century, privileging the imitator as an ideal and indispensable mediator. Even though these methodological positions are familiar, it is useful to re uh, review them again because they pinpoint the common options for the representation of a poet such as Kumar Narayan. However, despite the fact that most practicing translators still use all three orientations in variable combination with each other, even within the translation of a single source text, the shortcomings of these ubiquitous orientations are immediately evident. In their separate ways, but to an equal extent, a metaphrase that concentrates on the linguistic signification of a poem but disregards its aesthetic dimension, a paraphrase that suppresses the nuances and concrete details that give life to a poem, and an imitation that claims to capture the spirit of the original without rendering its verbal texture or structure, all fail to do justice to the original author's craft, message, and imagination. <coughs> Since the end of World War II, many translators working between different pairs of languages and poetic traditions have struggled with this fact about metaphrase, paraphrase, and imitation. And with the spectrum of limitations as well as the specter of injustice that these ideals have imposed methodologically on a global scale under Orientalism since early modernity. Working almost like an unconscious community, the best new translators of the post-1950 period have slowly hammered out a fourth alternative approach that has set a new international standard for literary translation in the first quarter of the 21st century. This is the ideal of rendering a poem with equal attention to its verbal composition, meaning and thematic content on the one hand, and its verse craft, form, generic conventions and aesthetic effects on the other, and carrying all these features together simultaneously from the source language into a host language. Such an effort flexibly combines the strategies of metaphrase, paraphrase and imitation as needed, but it goes beyond their combination by emphasizing the poetic qualities of the original so that a reader in a different medium experiences at least an approximation of the poem's mode of existence in the form and expression in which it was first composed. What this demanding standard actually invokes is the elusive ideal that both Dryden in the 1680s and Schleiermacher in the 1810s proposed as their most desirable option, namely that a translation ought to be the poem that its author might have composed if he or she were the same poet but working directly in the host language here and now to reproduce exactly what he or she created originally in the source language at another time and place. As the American poet Robert Lowell describes his own attempts, quote, I have tried to do what my authors might have done if they were writing their poems now and in America. In A.K. Ramanujan's characteristically elliptic formulation, only a poem in the second language can be a complete faithful rendering of a text that is a poem at its source. In my own approach to Narayan's short poems, as represented in the translations offered here, my goal has been to pursue this new international standard as summarized above 
rather than the separate older norms of metaphrase, paraphrase, and imitation. Section 3. Intertextual correspondence between poem and translation. Uh, a little bit later in this uh, section, I will uh, go on to four parts within the section, uh, which are going to deal with the four main tasks that the translator has to pursue. What then are the specific challenges that a translator faces when he or she attempts to render a poem by a writer of Kuvan Narayan's aesthetic skill, imaginative range and innovativeness from a medium such as 20th century Hindi into another language, whether that language is Indian, Asian or European or any other, and aims for a finished translation that does poetic justice not only to the contents of the source but also to its aesthetics. To keep the answer to this question conceptually tidy for now, a self-conscious translator has to distinguish pragmatically uh, between two main responsibilities. One is to establish a principle of one-to-one -one intertextual correspondence between a poem in a source language and its poetic rendering in a host language that is as reliable as possible on all verbal and aesthetic levels. If the correspondence works as intended, then a reader in the second culture can gain access to the original and experience at least approximately what a counterpart experiences when he or she encounters a poem's beauty and value in its own domestic environment. The translator's other responsibility, which is much harder to fulfill, is to produce a translation of a given poet that represents, with at least some measure of fidelity, his or her most characteristic or unique qualities in a comparative framework. If a method of comparative translation succeeds along such lines, then a translated poet stands out unmistakably in the co company of others in a crowded literary landscape, inside as well as outside the borders of the original medium. The principle of correspondence between two texts and the principle of comparison between one text and many, therefore together furnish the core of a model for the implementation of the new standard of poetic translation on an international scale. In the discussion that follows, I'll explore, explore, explore the intricacies and implications only of the first half of these principles, the principle of correspondence, without venturing into the second, which is the principle of comparison or comparative translation. If a translator wishes to do imaginative justice to a writer such as Kumar Narayan, then the intertextual correspondence between an original and a translation can no longer be just the metaphrase or interlinearity uh, promoted in conventional philological renderings. Instead, the matching of one text to another in a dynamic transportation of content and form across various discontinuities has to be accomplished on multiple levels that constitute what Roland Barth in his early semiology called a staggered structure. In my experience with multiple South Asian languages, historical periods, literary genres and authors, the staggered levels of signification in translation can be addressed most productively by working with four practical objects and objectives. First, devising a strategy to offset the asymmetries that separate a source, a source language and a host language. Second, identifying the techniques that best represent the verbal texture of a poem. Third, finding the means to faithfully replicate a poem's structures, and fourth, acquiring and using the verse craft required to capture the aesthetic qualities of the original. <laughs>
So uh, this is where I'm going to now have four subsections. Uh, the first uh, deals with the task of working with asymmetrical languages and what I call the principle of antithetical balance. The first level on which a translator has to bridge gaps in this way is the one on which the language of Narayan's poetry, conceived narrowly for the moment as Khadiboli in its 20th century normative form, relates to a host language such as uh, we have to uh, figure out how to bridge gaps um, where we are able to relate the language of Narayan's poetry across uh, various uh, gaps to a host language such as contemporary literary English. While Hindi and English geoculturally stand at two ends of the Indo-European linguistic spectrum and in one sense are continuous with each other, in Max Muller's famous phrase from 1883, Vedic is the oldest form of English that we have inherited historically, they also diverge in untranscendable ways. As is known all too well, Khadiboli in its written form and as Narayan uses it um, often in an unmixed form and occasionally with a mixture of other mediums such as Urdu and English, Khadiboli follows the pattern uh, of subject, object, verb, which is called the SOV order of syntax, whereas English gravitates towards the regularities of subject, verb, object, SVO. Hindi has two grammatical genders, but English has three. Verbs in Hindi are inflected for gender and number, while verbs in English are not. Hindi syntax retains vestiges of the middle voice, eight cases of substantives and even dative subjects, whereas English syntax does not, and so on to other intractable differences. But while the many intrinsic asymmetries and some symmetries between standard Hindi and English are easy to recognize, two facts often go unacknowledged in the context of translation. A. In their very constitution, the linguistic asymmetries between Khadiboli and English render any coherent, self-consistent conception of metaphrase impossible to achieve. And B. At the same time, the asymmetries of Hindi and English frequently stand in antithetical balance with respect to each other, which surprisingly turns out to be the feature that helps translators undercut the failures of metaphrase. If a translator rendering a short poem by Narayan into a language such as English patiently unpacks the asymmetries between the medium of the source text and the medium in an evolving translation, then he or she can find a balance between their mutual linguistic oppositions and can establish a usable poetic correspondence between the two texts, in spite of the impossibility of the naive correspondence required by metaphrase. One of Narayan's early poems, Us Chorpar, uh, from Chakraview, page 66, foregrounds the problems of asymmetry and the complications of antithetical balance in a particularly striking way. In my translation, and I'm just going to have time, I have time to just read the English version. In my translation, which specifically seeks to resolve these difficulties, the poem runs as follows. <clears throat> on the other shore. The faint lines of our attachment to things etched with our bases on luminous stones and the homeless dust gently dispersed by our breaths that has settled down in sticky crevices. These lines, this dust will wipe out hot summer winds, springs flowering, winter rains, and make the succession of elements in their mutual relations new again. I, 
you and they will hide inside the womb of the earth, suppressed somewhere within the speed of movement, we will be reduced to the merest of signs. Our words of love, yours and mine, will become the mute speech of prehistoric prehumans. The imprint of our bones, though light, will open the hearts of stones and shine. The language of history will then be inscribed on our backs. No one will grasp our true story. One, no one will believe in our religion and the grammar of our civilization will be dead by then. The original poem in Hindi is composed in cadence free verse rather than in metrically regular lines. It is divided into five quatrain-like units but without end rhymes. Each four-line unit is syntactically closed and contains one or more simple compound complex or compound complex sentence. But the set of sentences does not end at the end of the quatrain with a conventional full stop or purnaviram in the Devanagari script. Narayan explicitly marks the whole poem as a modernist and experimental text in Hindi by adopting only modern punctuation marks adapted from the Roman script system of English. Commas, colons and periods with a period appearing only once at the very end. The text's poetic complexity arises from the fact that each sentence and sequence of sentences within any one stanza is structurally complete but does not carry the punctuation of closure. And at the same time, the five open quatrains are sequenced one after another using the same syntactic structural principle as any one individual clause or sentence so that the poem as a whole emerges finally as a single hyper sentence with 15 verbs in primary and secondary roles. So what I read to you just now had all those features. This manifold arrangement progresses throughout the standard subject, object, verb, order of Khadiboli and rigorously preserves the linguistic asymmetry of Hindi with respect to English. The translator's principal challenge, then, is to convey the poem's imaginative construction in the host language by inverting the syntax to fit a subject-verb-object pattern, which makes my version antithetical to the original, and then extending the internally inverted order of the parts of the sentences to fit all five quatrains into a larger structure that mimics the integrity of the Hindi text, which imposes the contrapuntal demand for balance. Given the pressure that Narayan's poetics exerts on the poem's syntax and structure, the principle of antithetical balance is the only option available to compensate for the asymmetries between the two languages and to faithfully rendered, render the form, themes and aesthetics of the original while maintaining the natural flow of English in the translation. As I tried, uh, it took me a long time to translate that poem, uh, but that's what my goal was. That's the task I set for myself. Second, the task of representing verbal texture which is now a different task. On a second front, when dealing with Narayan's overall style, it is particularly important for a translator to analytically separate the layer of verbal texture from other features of the source text. Verbal texture metaphorically identifies what readers receive as the interweave of words constituting the so-called surface of a text. This texture links what the linguist Roman Jakobsen conceptualized as the sound shape of signifiers and their inseparable significations. By placing words, phrases, sentences, lines and verse units in an order that is at once temporal, that is one after another, as in speech or reading, and spatial, that is altogether together 
coexisting on a page in writing or print or now on a digital screen. The most common texture in Apne Samne 1979 and Koi Dusra Nahi 1993 and even in Indino which was uh, published in 2002, the most common texture in all three volumes is the common representation of a voice speaking in a semi-formal manner in middle diction resorting neither to the so-called low diction of street talk and intimate confidences or to the high diction of oratory and formal public discourse. Diction in this context goes beyond simplified interpretations of Aristotle's term lexis and refers to the choice of words as well as the disposition or arrangement of words so that both together create the weave of a well-defined tone of voice. As Robert Lowell noted, Boris, quote, Boris Pasternak said that the usual reliable translator gets the literal meaning but misses the tone, and that in poetry, tone is, of course, everything. In his careful preservation of a characteristic diction and tone across the short-form poems, genres and sub-genres that I have focused on here, Narayan combines a consistent, largely sun Sanskrit-based vocabulary with standard Khadiboli syntax, as normed in prose, to steer his enunciation along a course that is socially and culturally in the cultivated middle rather than at the extremes of colloquialism or rhetoric. A translator has to make strategic uh, choices on a large scale to render this verbal texture as precisely as possible, which is a distinct subsidiary criterion in itself of fidelity to the original, because Narayan's middle diction in Hindi is also the vehicle for several other features of his poetics. My translations maintain a consistent middle diction in English with several devices that can be applied across themes and genres. For example, the vocabulary in my versions, and those of you um, have uh, seen these in various publications uh, in the West, uh, will know what I'm referring to. Uh, for example, the vocabulary in these versions of mine avoid uh, avoids informal contractions such as I am, we have, doesn't, uh, with only a few exceptions. Furthermore, all phrases and clauses in my translations are represented in standard English, corresponding antithetically to Narayan's standard Hindi syntax in the originals, except when ellipses or sentence fragmentation are used for poetic effect. In contrast, as comparisons with my translations of other contemporaneous Hindi poets would show easily, writers such as Raghuveer Sahai and Srikant Verma mix levels of diction, hybridize formal and informal styles, and introduce heteroglossia into the texture of their verse quite extensively, which make verbal contraction non-standard punctuation and fragmented syntax, among other devices, indispensable for a reliable representation of their respective poetic styles in English. Very different process from that of translating Nar uh, Narayan. Two examples may be useful in pinpointing the kinds of nuances that appear when rendering a poet's uh, skillful modulations of verbal texture. My first instance is a translation of another early poem by Narayan, Shishe Ka Kavach, uh, from Chakravyu, uh, pages 90 to 91, which first highlights the roles of both diction and uh, roles that both diction and tone play in the definition of a poem's surface of words, and second also shows how an attentive mimesis of the source text's strict control of both word choice and word order, 
the twofold articulation of its di diction, as well as its tone of voice, a calm voice of reason, in this case combining understated argument and imaginative ekphrasis or descriptive visualization, can give a reader in the host language a glimpse of the original's poetic interweave. So let me quickly read the translation of uh, Shisheka Kavach, uh, which I titled The Glass Shield. <clears throat> a sea of blue. To this day you stand with your heart completely open, with thousands of epochs dissolved in your silence, your omnipresence. You are right, the soul is enormous. You are the full extent of our question, but not its answer. We have continued to install our gods in shrines, to pick out distant unheard sounds in our inmost consciousness, to make lotuses blossom in our body soil, to erect temples. You are the thing that history has, has trampled in its stride, and ground to a powder that belief has found repeatedly, though far from life. You are not the chosen stone in our tall religious buildings. You are the full extent of our question, but not its answer. Every transcendent form has been ruined on earth. A blot has always fallen on every glow. The body has been pierced by the thorn of doubt. Human beings have touched the divine and then rotted away, finding again and again that you, zero blue sky, are not God. You are the full extent of our question, but not its answer. A controlled mimesis of texture is consequential in this case because the glass shield does not immediately name the object to which the word you refers diactically and builds up only gradually with puzzlement and tension to reveal that the you is the zero blue sky which does not embody anthropomorphic divinity. My second example of the translator's mimetic responsibility to verbal texture comes from the subgenre of poetic satire, which Narayan develops and deploys in several different ways. The control of diction and tone as the principal determinants of texture is usually indispensable in the delivery of satire, as much in Hindi as in English and other languages. Narayan's political satire draws on the technique of indirection rather than on direct or abrasive attack. As he notes in his authorial introduction to Akaro Ke Aspas, uh, his short stories, 1971, I am naturally inclined to say what I have to say in a non-inflammatory style and I like to say it in an atmosphere that is not inflammatory. His satirical poems therefore have to be rendered with the close calibration of vocabulary as well as syntax, as uh, in Mahabharat, which is a poem from Koi Dusra Nahi, uh, page 69. Mahabharat, two separate words. Mahabharat. Dhritarashtra, the king, blind. Vidur, the advisor, his ethics failed. Yudhishthir and Duryodhan, hero and villain, gamblers, both of them, Shakuni, the cheat, his entry into politics to the sound of rattling dice. No field of dharma, no field of the kurus, just the field of elections, straight and simple. The thunderous cacophony of conches, blown by great warriors and chariots gathered in this field because of their powerful quests for victory, the blessed commencement of war, 
waging battle in the marshes of political factions, eight religions, 18 languages, 28 states. On one side, in a tranquil frame of mind, standing in a chariot holding the Gita, Lord Krishna. On the opposite side, holding the bow Gandiva in one hand and his head in the other, Arjun, both watching a nation mutate from India to India the Great. An attentive mimesis of this poem's verbal strat strategies is vital because the Hindi wording is stripped bare of almost all artifice in order to foreground the conclusion and it depends for its satirical force entirely on the microscopic explosion of figuration and rhyme in the final lines, namely, both watching a nation mutate from India to India the Great. The third task is the task of reproducing structures. Since the element of disposition or arrangement in diction already involves the organization of parts into wholes, the layer of texture on the surface of a Narayan poem is analytically related to the staggered levels on which verbally articulated structures become explicit underneath it. In his short form as well as his long form poetry, the latter as in say Atma in 1965, Narayan's most unusual uh, and characteristic principle of structuring the words, sentences and verse units in a poem and of organizing a poem as a whole is the principle of shaping a poetic text with an argument as distinct from an emotion a mood, an episode, or a narrative. That is, a typical Narayan short poem in a volume like Apne Samne proceeds with an argumentative structure, a web of overlaid lines of reasoning that implicitly or explicitly determines its beginning, middle, and end without producing a piece of didactic or moralizing discourse. Narayan constructs poetic arguments that are imaginative rather than dogmatic, persuasive rather than assertive, deliberative rather than epidactic, with deliberation exactly as in Jürgen Habermas's sense, expanding as an exploration of all available choices that may be good to different degrees in a given life world situation viewed from multiple points of view. This is a challenge for a translator who seeks to develop a reliable correspondence between what a Narayan poem does in its own medium and what a representation that enacts verbally in its name, uh, what a representation then enacts verbally in its name in another language because this takes poetry to words, the kind of verbal structuring that we find, for example, in Wallace Stevens' classically argumentative American modernist poems. My translations uh, that I've presented here touch on only a small range of the poetic arguments that drive Narayan's short poetry. On the other shore, uh, and the glass shield, for example, articulate lines of reasoning on philosophical and spiritual issues, whereas Mahabharata and Ayodhya 1992, which I'll discuss in a moment, lay out positions and debates on political, historical and cultural themes. Let me emphasize just one distinctive example of the kinds of argumentation that Narayan constructs. In a broader contrast that I would emphasize, the poetic argument in a poem such as Asal Baat Koi Dusra Nahi uh, takes a uniquely composite form, imaginatively fusing the private, the individual and the psychological with the collective, the existential and the social in a beautifully crafted concrete yet abstract whole that deliberately masks its multiple meanings.
So let me read out my English version of Asal Baat from Koi Dusra Nahi. The real reason. Asleep but without repose, with the desire born of intermittent needs politely under cover. Or awake, and if so, for what purpose? The world was so big, but it proved to be too small whenever I wished to spread myself even a bit beyond the ready-made boundaries around me. Frightened by the sum of obscene experiences, I drew myself in like the neck of a tortoise under the hardback shell of self-confidence, or else I ran in confusion towards some abyss that opened out within the reach of my understanding. Caught between arguments and raucous laughter, I sat apart and took stock of the situation from a special standpoint. It was pointless to try to keep the world under my control. It would be better to get up and leave with a little consternation, saying, what place was that? From what date to what date? The true bone of contention was what did not happen. All life long we remained stuck in the testimonies, recommendations and safety nets of enervated conversations. What sort of freedom can one find from minds imprisoned in their beliefs, cities, businesses that no one can traverse on the inside or the outside? I ask you one last time, what was the real matter that resulted in such a long punishment? Just the silence? Okay, let it go. What is there in reality? Like a school teacher's net balance of income and expenses, reality's decision is the final judgment. Make do with that and no more when in bed Stretch your legs only as far as the sheet will go. I cannot believe that the difficulty I survived, that the life I spent, not by resting my brow against another brow, but by holding my head in my hands, was such a small thing, reduced to a document that listed every pointless antic but included no crime, with the sole exception of my daily self-destruction. From a translator's standpoint, a meticulous rendering of poetic arguments in a poem such as this one is then a central goal of translation because in their diversity of forms, these constructions, these lines of reasoning set him apart from contemporary, contemporaneous poets in Hindi as well as other languages. No other poet really does what Narayan does with argumentation. The fourth task of versification and aesthetics. And then I'll just have a relatively short conclusion. The translator's fine-tuning of methods of rendition is challenged further by the fact that Narayan superposes the plane of versification on the planes of verbal texture, structure alignment, and sequenced argument. The layer of poetic craft is a locus of consolidation as well as innovation because it gathers language, texture, structure, and form at a single location and activates Narayan's post-colonial modernist goal Allah Ezra Pound, to make it new. Besides the Stevens-like paradigm of innovation that foregrounds rational argument, even as it invokes Wordsworthian models of the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings and emotion recollected in tranquility, a prominent element in Narayan's repertoire is the imagist principle of the direct Testament, uh, the direct treatment of a thing, as formulated by Pound, F. S. Flint, Hilda Doolittle, Richard Aldington, and T. He Hume, uh, 
around 1911-1912. The imagist notion of the direct treatment of the objects of poetic representation with the material things, personal experiences, private memories, social and ideological conflicts or political events plays an increasingly foundational role um, in Narayan's poetic technique with the passage of time, especially after the 1970s. Uh, as a quick example uh, of what I'm talking about, let me move on to read uh, Ayodhya 1992 uh, with the following comment. On the level on which Narayan's versification is articulated uh, is thus at the location where, in part, the aesthetics of his poetic poetry begins. A translator who aims to be faithful to Narayan's aesthetic effects in a host language is therefore obliged to retrace the consolidations and innovations woven into his Hindi verse craft. The translations that I've managed to share with you should indicate that for a meticulous translator, the technical obligations are neither trivial nor dispensable. Uh, as I've noted already, the rendering of On the Other Shore has to replicate Narayan's unprecedented use of a minor punctuation mark, a colon, instead of a semicolon, dash, or period at the end of each quatrain like verse, so that the entire poem emerges as a single integrated sentence. In contradistinction, the rendition that I just read out of The Real Reason has to be particularly sensitive to his use of ellipses, fragmentation, and juxtaposition, so that it can capture his effect of suggestion, modeled on classical Sanskrit dhvani, beyond the reach of routine denotation and connotation in English. Moreover, each translation has to adapt English syntax to the subliminal flow of an argument that carries out a powerful aesthetic fusion of the antithetical trajectories of reason and emotion. And the best example of this is Ayodhya 1992 from Koi Dusra Nahi. Uh, the book was published in 1993, as I've noted. Ayodhya 1992. Life is a bitter reality, O Ram, while you remain an epic. This victory of follies that now possesses not ten or twenty, but hundreds of thousands of heads and hands is no longer under your control. And besides, who knows on which side Vibhishan is fighting now. What can be a greater misfortune for us than to have your sovereign power cut down to the size of a piece of contested ground? Ayodhya today is not the Ayodhya of your day, but a Lanka of warriors. The Manas of Tulsi Das is not a song of your deeds, but a drumbeat for an election. What times are these, O Ram? Where is your golden age? Where are you most honorable of men? And why this age of Machiavellians? We humbly beg you, O Lord, to retreat into an ancient book, some great religious tome, with wife and good fortune in tow. The jungle out there today is not the forest Valmiki used to roam. The aesthetic poem, uh, impact of this poem in Hindi depends on its unusual combination of rhythmical free verse, again with minimal figuration in its main body, but with strong rhymes at the end that in this translation with the poetic effect of the conceptual con uh, which in this translation I've reflected with the poetic effect of the conceptual contrast between forest and jungle. But the texture here also shifts from spare description and declarative sentences at the beginning to an increasingly lyrical tone as the political art argument expands, 
which I have tried to indicate with light alliteration, consonance, assonance, and echo bordering on rhyme in the middle three units. In tone as well as texture, the verse craft of Ayodhya 1992 is representative of the aesthetics of the middle period of Narayan's career, specifically of what Aristotle called uh, the melos or melodic beauty of his special kind of flexible yet lyrical free verse. Uh, last section, temporary conclusion. As readers will have gathered, the foregoing discussion has explicated several aspects of the tasks and responsibilities that a translator of Narayan short form poetry is obliged to pursue. The kind of correspondence between a source and its inter intertextual rendition with which he or she has to work um, in actuality cannot be reduced methodologically to the models of metaphrase, paraphrase and imitation that have been promoted conventionally in European theories and practices of translation particularly in the Orientalist relation to India since the late 18th century. Even a basic analysis of the kind offered here, offered here shows unambiguously that the one-to-one -one correspondence between original and rendition that a translator has to construct today goes well beyond the limited linguistic correspondence that supposedly underlies metaphrase. Uh, in practice, two intertexts have to match each other uh, on levels and sub-levels in addition to the level of antithetical balance between asymmetrical languages. A poem's verbal texture, the structures embodied in its vocabulary, syntax and verse units, the trajectories of its poetic argument, and the aesthetic set in motion by its verse craft. If a translator wishes to satisfy the criteria of the new international standard of poetic translation, in which the transfer of aesthetic effects across mediums is as essential as the transmission of content and meaning, then the type of manifold intertextual correspondence analyzed above has to be the basis of a translator's selection of general orientation, practical goals, and specific strategies of translation. Uh, last uh, two uh, uh, paragraphs very quickly. Uh, such an approach to the translation of Narayan's short form poems, limited as it is mainly to examples from three collections published between 1956 and 1993, can be justified only by a larger poetics of his work that encompasses the many kinds of poetry and prose that he produced uh, over um, seven uh, decades. Um, since time and space are limited, I cannot lay the groundwork for such a poetics, uh, which cannot be constructed without the process of comparative translation uh, that I mentioned in passing earlier. But it is still possible to outline one indispensable feature of Narayan's writerly practice that points towards a larger frame of evaluation. In a frame of this sort, Narayan occupies a distinctive position on the spectrum of modernism that has now expanded theoretically into geomodernism and planetary modernism and stretches around the globe from the late 19th century uh, to the present. His position may be described specifically as one of late modernist classicism which drives many of the poetic arguments that he constructs on social, political, historical, cultural, philosophical and aesthetic issues of common concern in the 20th and early 21st centuries. These arguments are always articulated along strong lines of reasoning, even when their thrust is primarily imaginative and affective or emotional. Unlike the arguments constructed by most of his contemporaries in Hindi, and in other Indian and South Asian languages, Narayan's method of deliberation, debate and reasoning fits exactly into Immanuel Kant's twin paradigms of reason as, and this is Kant's definition, common human understanding. And secondly, reason as it appears in 
public use and hence stays within the orbit of globalized modernisms. As the uh, audience can work out for itself, the similarities and differences between Narayan and other poets of his literary generation that emerge from comparisons in an open framework cumulatively highlight three features of his poetry that are characteristic of his uniqueness or what I would venture to call his literary originality. First, he is exceptional because in the midst of so many, he fashions an unmistakable poetic voice and tone for himself. Narayan's voice is not what T.S. Eliot classifies as the first voice of poetry, which is the voice of the poet talking to himself or to nobody in particular. Rather, Narayan fits into what is the so-called second voice, which is the voice of the poet addressing an audience, whether large or small, and I'm quoting Eliot's words here. The first voice frames a poet's most private or intimate mode of utterance, which we only overhear in Euro-American poems of the modernist lyric genre, especially in interior monologues and confessional poems. Whereas the second voice, which is what Narayan cultivates, projects the mode of direct communication between a poet and others, or between a poetic persona and its implied audience. In this second voice, this is the second point, in this second voice, Narayan is distinctive because his tightly constructed but often subterranean arguments initiate a shift in the very foundations of short-form poetry, creating a new fusion of reason and emotion that is not merely lyric, lyrical or confessional. And third, he is original because he consistently uses the short uh, poem to speak as a member of the society of citizens of the world who addresses all fellow citizens everywhere exactly as Immanuel Kant would have it in the interest of constructing an ethical, secular and non-violent intersubjective order of coexistence, communication and cooperation on terms that all can accept. This last long phrase was from Gareth Williams, a commentator on Kant. Constantly embattled in arguments with himself in what seemed to be conventional trajectories of interior monologue, Narayan pinpoints this Kantian perspective self-reflexively over and over again. And especially in the final emotionally charged verses of the poem we know as Asanna Sankatme, in Apne Samne, uh, which I translate as imminent danger. Here are just a few lines from Asanna Sankatme. Whenever I let my hypocrisy, uh, my, sorry, whenever I let my honesty heat up like anger until I want to spoil things for someone else by being unpleasant, the habit of nastiness is extinguished and even the strength to see that poetry, courage and rage are three different kinds of madness loses itself in a dishonest suggestion. Whenever I want to make some special use of the understanding that is entangled in 500 million activities and occupations, I begin to wonder whether it isn't some sort of a crime to hold opinions that differ from those of many on things that matter to many. To use phrasing that Jürgen Habermas would endorse, Kuan Narayan is one of the premier poets of the past 75 years in world literature whose oeuvre piece by piece continues with the unfinished project of modernity in an imaginative mode that is uniquely his own. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your patience. And uh, since I wasn't available uh, to be um, 
a participant live uh, on Zoom uh, with you. Uh, I would be happy to receive responses and comments uh, by email. Uh, you can find my email address uh, at the University of Wisconsin Madison website. Uh, so please feel free to write uh, if you have any um, comments or questions. Uh, it may take me a little uh, time to respond because uh, I have a very busy semester on my hands already, uh, but I will uh, definitely respond um, within four to six weeks if if I need that much time. Okay. Thank you and good night to everybody.